Welcome to Fat Chicks on Top. This podcast contains frank discussions about the body, sexuality, and occasionally uses swear words, which may not be appropriate for people under the age of 18. This podcast also uses facts, statistics, and mathematics, which may not be appropriate for liberal arts majors. And this podcast relies on science and reality, which may not be appropriate for evangelicals. Welcome to Fat Chicks on Top. You're here with your host, Auntie Vice, and it's good to be back. Today, I'm super excited to have sex writer and writer in general, Zachary Zane. He writes the Sexplain It column for uh, Men's Health, and he has a new book out, Boy Slut. So, of course, we had to have him on the show. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me on here. Before we delve into the book in total, you do a ton of sex writing. You've been doing it for years and years. What made you, as a writer, want to take sexuality seriously? Oh, wow. So, I i mean, delving really right into it here. Let's <laughs> do it. Um, so, I'm bisexual. And when I started writing about uh, bisexuality almost a decade ago at this point, we're, we're not getting any younger, that's for sure. There was really a dearth of bisexual content online. Um, there was maybe like 10 things to never say to a bisexual person or 10 myths about bisexuality. It was all content that was like essentially trying to like force straight and gay people to justify our existence. It wasn't any content for bi people. And so I ended up starting to write content for bi people about how to date while being bi and the struggles that come from that and their unique struggles, how to deal with internalized biphobia. When can you call yourself bisexual? What's the difference between bi and pan? Why do I embrace one label as opposed to the other? But essentially doing content for bisexual people. Like, um, yeah, because I felt for years, I felt so alone and I would I would think I was gay. I'd think I was straight. And while, you know, I'm egocentric, I'm not delusional, right? Like I was like, I can't be the only bi guy in the world. I didn't know a single other bi guy. And every guy in college who came out as bi shortly identified as gay afterwards. So I'm like, it can't be me. And it wasn't until I got into therapy that I realized like, no, I'm definitely bisexual. My therapist was like, you're you're clearly bisexual. What am I missing? And I said, oh, that shit doesn't exist in men. And he said, Zach, you're too smart to think that, which is kind of such a great response, like a little ego jab too. Um, So really the beginning of my writing started because I wanted to be a voice for the bisexual community and to really start creating a, a community as well. And one thing I realized through my work is I'm I'm not special. And that was kind of the best thing I learned where it's like, yes, I maybe have been to more sex parties than you've had or had more sexual partners. I might be a little bit sluttier, but in terms of my experience embracing my bisexuality, the confusion I had, the lack of community, the struggles that I face... I'm really not alone in this. And so that's one thing through my work where I often get like messages from so many bi people across the world being like, oh my God, I felt so alone until I read your work. There are other people out there like me. I'm like, there are millions of other people out there just like you. We're just not as loud and vocal and visible, but I'm trying to really change that. And the landscape has so changed. When I came out as bi, which was like, years ago mm -hmm. <laughs> there the there were very few people identifying as bisexual it's like well you're we would call them lugs lesbian until graduation right and then you went on and and but now bisexuals are the largest group in the lgbtq spectrum not, not only that, like if you look at the studies, more and more people are identifying as bi like every single year, like like our numbers are growing uh, as well. And I, I don't see that stopping. And that's not, you know, because of hormones in the milk or something like that. You know what I mean? I've bi people have been around forever. We just feel more comfortable, comfortable identifying as such. And maybe because we're seeing less homophobia and biphobia, obviously with some major setbacks, of course, that still exists rampantly. But more people are actually embracing their attractions, acting on their attractions, and then identifying as bisexual. 
So when you started really embracing the bi identity, how did dating change for you? Oh, so initially I, I was very foolish. I, I thought the world was going to be my oyster and oysters are an aphrodisiac and everyone's going to want to date me with open arms. And that was not the case. When I came out, uh, many women refused to date me uh, when they found out I was bi. And I was never like hiding it. I'd say to my profile on our first date, whatever it was, they were very afraid I was going to leave them for a man and using the label as a stepping stone before being full-blown gay. And then gay men were just extremely condescending. They'd be like, oh, honey, I was bi too. You'll get there. And I'm like, and then, and then they'll like try to kiss me and I'll be like, wow, fuck you. Like, absolutely not. That's a wildly rude thing to say. But if I was saying that to you being like, oh, honey, you think you're gay? You're actually just straight. Sorry, you'll get there. You'd be like, oh, no, that's wildly homophobic. But a gay guy says that to a bi guy and you're like, oh, no, that's totally acceptable. So it was really challenging. And actually, the first piece I ever wrote, the first article I ever wrote was for Exo Jane. If you remember that site, mm-hmm. they had a, a vertical called It Happened to Me. And it was like they'd give you $50 to like overshare the most personal thing about your life that was like as outrageous and ridiculous as possible. And all things considered, my article was pretty tame. But what they titled it was, I came out as bi and now can't date anyone gay or straight. And I spoke about all the struggles I had dating as a bi person. Then I, then I fell in love with another bi person. All of a sudden, like it was so much easier. I felt accepted, loved, and embraced. I didn't worry about appearing too effeminate, you know, in front of my female partner, right? Like she actually loved the elements of the femininity within me. And she wasn't worried that this meant I was secretly gay. We spoke about hot guys together we wanted to fuck. We spoke about hot girls together we wanted to fuck. But it was just like so empowering and beautiful to just feel embraced and loved and fully accepted and understood. And that piece went viral in a way that like I was really not expecting. And I think it just resonated with so many people like addressing the challenges. And, you know, like people always like, well, as a bi person, like, how do you date gay or straight people? I'm like, date bi people. That is what I do. (laughs) That is like, since I've come out as bi, I've not dated a woman who has not been bi. Uh, And that's in large part because straight women will not date me. Uh, Or they're just like unique challenges. I have to deal with a lot of their insecurities that I'm like, I just don't want to fucking deal with this. I'm a grown ass man. And while I have dated gay men, these gay, gay men are very open and queer and still will maybe hook up with women, whatever it is, like I still prefer to date by men. And that's the majority of who I'm dating ends up being bi or or honestly, someone who is non-binary or trans who almost like appreciate my bisexuality more, especially if they're non-binary, because like, oh, you are attracted to actually all aspects of my gender. You're attracted to the masculinity, you're attracted to the femininity, you don't care about my body parts like in that way. We're attracted to all my body parts, whatever it is. So I do have healthy relationships with non-binary people kind of too, because I feel like they embrace my bisexuality in a unique way. Well, and the rise of people identifying as non-binary in France has also been huge with the bi community because, you know, when you're out as bi, it's like whatever the equipment is, you can work with it. So, exactly. Right? It, it's, it's, yeah, absolutely. It's fantastic. So in, we just came through Pride Month and you went out and did a ton of stuff during Pride. Being very visible as a bi representative, how was Pride this year? So I was actually traveling for almost all of it for my book tour. And that was really cool because I got to go to other cities during their Pride as well. It just happened to overlap. What was cool was seeing, you know, I was in like a Montana. I happened to be there during the Pride, during Missoula Pride. And like the number of bi flags I saw absolutely that people were, you know, wearing or, you know, uh, dressed as a cape, whatever it is, was really, really cool. And something that when I came out 10 plus years ago, whatever it was, like uh, we weren't seeing that, you you know, like the, the same way. So I think that was a really cool thing. And just seeing more bisexual visibility in that way through the flag. One thing I really talk about in my book with regards to visibility is how it can be really challenging to be visible when you're bisexual, right? Because unless if you have a a man on your arm and a woman on your other arm and a non-binary person on your third arm and you're all making out, which honestly sounds like my dream quad, I I would love that. Uh, But like, like it's very tough to be visibly bisexual, right? If you're a man in a relationship with another man, they assume you're gay, uh, they assume you're straight, whatever it is. So 
because of that, we have to approach visibility slightly differently for bi people, right? And what I coined was the word bisexual audibility, being like, hey, we need to actually say we are bi. We need to be as loud and obnoxious about it as humanly possible because we can't be visibly bi kind of the same way. And you can't tell by looking at us that we're bi or whatever it is. So that's one thing that's very important to me is just like using the label, talking about your partners, embracing it. And whether you say you're pansexual, fluid, whatever it is, but talking about your attraction and your romantic relationships with uh, people of different genders. That's really important to actually say the words and talk about it. So you talk about bisexuality. Why settle on that label versus the plethora of options we have now? Yeah, sure. Um, So for me, there are a few reasons. Number one, I I felt like it described my behavior, right? Like, And I felt like I was really part of the community. It is a historic word or that people know what it means. There's still a lot of confusion with pansexuality. And like, I, I write the sex relationship advice column for men's health. I write a lot of sex content for men's health. I have a lot of older men, not older, but you know, 40s, 50s, mm-hmm. 60s, whatever it is. And like, they find me through Google and they use the word bisexual. Like, like if they wouldn't even know how to find me, if I use the word pansexual, they are not familiar with it. And I'm helping these guys who've been in straight relationships, thought they were straight, come out to their wives, identify their bisexuality. Like there's a history behind this label. People know what you're talking about. And for me, I've never thought of it as being, you know, not inclusive of trans people, not inclusive of non-binary people. I think that's kind of ridiculous. Uh, I'm pretty sure the people who came up with the bi label was not like, oh, but fuck non-binary people. We're not including them. It was just like, no, we didn't have an understanding of gender and the nuances of it that we do right now. And I'm attracted to all genders. So for me, it, it just defines what I am. I also want to honor kind of some other bi activists before me, you know, uh, Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson. Like these are bi trans activists. And so for me, it was like this word describes me. Uh, it is it is inclusive word it is a historic label. It's LGBT. It's one of the first four we had here. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. I don't really need to use another label. And I feel like a lot of the reason why people don't like using the word bisexual is because there are often so many negative connotations associated with it, the way there's not necessarily with fluid or pansexual or ambisexual, polysexual, whatever it is. And for me, it's like, well, no, like I, I rather kind of like reclaim this word and kind of remove the negative connotations as opposed to being like, oh, well, they win if I end up changing my label and my identity because I'm afraid of these negative connotations. Like, no, I like I, I want to em- embrace this label. And I felt really mm-hmm. a sense of community. Uh, through that. And that said, I want you to identify however you see fit, right? If you want to identify as pansexual, poly, whatever it is, and I just want you to extend that courtesy to other people. One of the negative connotations around bi people is that we're super slutty. I don't see it as a negative connotation. I embrace it. I I, I mean, cl- clearly clear. so do I with my book called Boy Slut. Yeah. Right. Uh, But it does change how you have to talk about safer sex and all of that. And being out on the dating scene, especially now post-COVID and with prep readily available, what do safer sex conversations look like when you're bi? I mean, I think it looks the same way it does when you or any other sexual orientation as well. I, I think when you're bi, there is potentially more of a fear of HIV because you're sleeping with men or uh, as a bi man. I mean... For me, I let people know, like I get tested once every six weeks. I'm on prep. I don't use condoms with everyone. And I let people know that like, like, like there is a potential that you will get gonorrhea or chlamydia sleeping with me, which a, even if you do wear condoms with everyone, there still is that potential as well. You can get it through oral sex as well. You can get oral gonorrhea, oral chlamydia, all of the stuff. But I I think I, what I really try to do is let like, hey, this is my risk level. I'm more comfortable taking higher risk. I don't have um, protected sex with everyone. Do you feel comfortable having sex with? You know what I mean? Like, And being like, hey, of course, we will wear condoms. But if you're like, oh, is Zach wearing condoms with other people? No, I'm not. So like, you are taking a risk by having sex with me. And so I'm just giving you all the information you need so you can make that decision. I know with my partner, and we recently just split up, but we broke up amiably, which is was very needed. I've had some rough breakups, so to have like a uh, amiable breakup is quite nice. But the way we kind of did it, because she was very STI averse, versus I am not. For me, getting gonorrhea is not the end of the world. I go, I get tested, I get treated, I tell my partners I don't have sex for a week. Yeah. It's just not the biggest deal for me, the way it is for other people. 
But what we would do was we would essentially like I get tested every six weeks or so. And after a negative result came back, we would have unprotected sex, let's say, for two, three weeks until I'd be like, hey, I'm going to this sex party, whatever it is, or I'm going on date with this person. I'm probably going to have unprotected sex. If I do, I let her know. Then we continue wearing condoms for however long until I get tested again. So that was a way that we could have that she felt comfortable. I felt comfortable. And that required clearly more communication and a lot of trust. But that's what worked for us uh, in a way where like I still wanted to have unprotected sex with other people. She didn't feel comfortable with that. She didn't want to be like, well, you can't if you want to do this. So we found a middle ground that worked actually quite well for both of us. It's fantastic. That's fantastic. So you embrace the the term slut. And there are those of us who are out there who are very happy to be slutty. Uh, yeah. when, did, when did you start getting comfortable thinking of yourself as a slut? It's, I mean, obviously there's a big double standard, right? Like I am a man and it's kind of a little bit more cheeky when I call myself a slut. The word hasn't been like hurled at me in a way to control my behavior, in a way to denigrate me and uh, make me feel like shit. So like, I do want to be aware of that, but I was kind of hoping and identifying as a slut, I can kind of expose the double standard between men and women and create kind of a culture where we all can actually embrace being sluts and it being a good thing. And I I think for me, as we kind of speaking about this a little bit earlier, like the negative connotations and stereotypes, it was very important for me to be like, which are the stereotypes about being bi are actually bad versus which ones are just like uh, a a stereotype about bisexual people versus being like bisexual people are liars, are cheaters. uh, Like that's bad. Like like, uh, saying that we're all liars or cheaters. It is not good to be a liar. It's not good to be a cheater. That is something I very much disagree with and i'd buy people are not that versus if you're like oh bi people are slutty well there's nothing actually wrong with being slutty obviously bi people are a diverse population and unique group just like every other population unique group they're going to be slutty people not slutty people whatever the fuck it is and you shouldn't generalize and that's just stupid if you do but like being like okay can we take a look at the connotations that are inherently bad and the ones that are just like actually not bad but you shouldn't just be stereotyping and slut definitely falls into that latter category right your book title is boy slut and it includes a manifesto so what is yeah. the boy slut manifesto oh my goodness it's it's how to live your life without sexual shame and the thing is and i want you to really own what your relationship with sex is it's not just you know, uh, going out and having as much casual sex as possible or fucking everyone in sight. If you want to do that, if you want to post up at a sauna taking bareback loads every day until you die, I want you to feel comfortable and embrace doing that as long as it's coming from a place of love and self-worth and not coming from, you know, that, that could be coming from a potentially different place, but that's besides the point. But if you are asexual or demisexual and uh you know only want to hop into bed with someone once you have a romantic connection with them i want you to own that if you are vanilla i want you to own that if you are kinky i want you to own that if you are someone who wants to be non-monogamous or really wants to be monogamous whatever it is i want you to own what your relationship with sex is and whatever your relationship orientation is And I want you to work hard in finding someone who matches it because we live in this incredible world with 8 billion people out there. It is easier than ever to meet people online. It's also very challenging. Obviously, dating is hard. I'm not trying to oversimplify it here. But no matter, I want you to figure out what you want sexually, who you want to date, the type of relationship you want. And I want you to pursue it and own it without a lick of shame. So most of us were not raised to embrace our sexuality. And we no. are at a point where politically they're trying to obliterate any positive mm. association with sexuality. So for you, how did you come to a point where you were okay embracing what you wanted? Yikes. Uh, that is like a part of the thesis of the book. So it, it's going to be hard to kind of Summary, you kind of have to see my journey a little bit mm-hmm. for how I reached this point because I grew up with such immense sexual shame. And that's kind of the beginning chapters of the book and how I was reached a place of owning and embracing it. But I, I will say a couple bits of advice here uh, that might be helpful for listeners. But I think the first is often trying to figure out where this shame is coming from. Is this something that you actually believe or you've been taught to believe? 
Is this something you believe because the church instilled it in you, your family or parents or your conservative upbringing instilled it in you? And really trying to get your own set of values as opposed to ones that have just been ingrained in you. And that might mean taking a step away from the church, taking a step away from your family, whatever it is. And one thing I heard recently was like, whose voice do you hear? Like, do you hear your pastor's voice in your head? Who Do you hear your mother's voice? Like, so I, I think if you can really identify the root of your shame and being able to separate yourself from it, being like, okay, hey, this is actually not what I believe. This is not even my voice. Like, it's much easier to tell your shame to kind of fuck off. Um, and the second thing I'll say is that shame really thrives in isolation. You know what I mean? That like, so what, when you're kind of having a shame spiral or you're anxious about something, it if you kind of stay by your, if you only think about it by yourself, like it can, it can spiral out of control. So I think having a supportive community, you know, in the queer community, we often use the word chosen family, but you surround yourself with other sex positive people, with other understanding people, with people that don't shame you. So you have people to talk to, Hey, I'm, I'm feeling ashamed by this. I'm embarrassed by this. I feel guilty for these desires, these behaviors. And when you actually have this community it can be really helpful. And whether that means, you know, at first it might be sort of a digital community, you know, it could be through FetLife, it could be through Reddit, especially if you're from like, you know, a small homophobic town, you're coming out 18, 19, you have no one to talk to about this, being able to talk about your sexual desires and people have so much shame for their kinks, so much shame, like being able to talk to other people on FetLife being like, oh, that's hot. This is how you do it consensually and safely. Like, like that's a really huge thing. So you can really start with also like a digital community uh, as well. For you, as you dealt with sexual shame, did it bleed over into other parts of your life and change your relationship with any other aspect of who you were? It's, yeah, I, I think, yeah, and I keep on being like, oh, I talk about this in the book, but like, no, I, I do talk about this in the book, but it's like sex influences everything. Right. Our relationship with sex, if we're having satisfying sex, if we're having enough sex with our partners, that's rewarding. If we're feeling rejected for sex by our partners, like it's not like this all just exists inside the bedroom. Like it all seeps out into every aspect of your life to how happy you are, how good you are at your job, how much you're how well you're treating your friends, how well you're treating your partners. If you're engaged with your family, like sex does not exist in isolation, which and so. We're seeing now, and this is like a big shift I've seen in the past kind of decade too, is really being like how sex is so important for your mental health and for your emotional health and being like, yes, like pleasure for pleasure's sake is incredible. And I 100% support that. You deserve pleasure. You deserve to have fulfilling sexual connections. But it also extends beyond pleasure, right? It also affects your sense of self and your and so many other parts of your life. So, so it, the short answer is like, I, I see the short answer after I give a long answer, but the short answer is like, yes, it, it did affect almost every other aspect of my life as well. When I had the sexual shame, it was really difficult for me to function with my friends, with my family in school, uh, in so many other elements of my life. You talk about, uh, as part of this, you go to therapy and for men to go to therapy, there's still a barrier for a lot of folks. So for you, what drew you into therapy and how was it as a, Dude, walking into a therapist office saying, I want to talk. It, I was very uh, lucky. Uh, so I grew up with terrible OCD. Not why I was lucky. I should clarify that. But I was lucky that I had a mother who quickly caught it. So by the time I was seven or eight, I was already in therapy. And I didn't realize until I called her up for the book. So I'm kind of fact checking my memory because this stuff happened decades ago, literally, you know what I mean? Um, and she told me that a lot of her friends judged her. She thought these were like mere childhood eccentricities that I would grow out of. And she was like, no, 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 this is mental illness. Like, like he needs, he needs help. Also, like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do for my fucking son. Like, I need you to back mm -hmm. off. Right. And her friends did. And doing so, potentially saved my life. Like I, I was I had terrible OCD growing up. I could not function in any aspect. Like I was, um, and a lot of my OCD manifested in sexual shame, which I address, but like I would check my alarm clock to make sure it was on like a hundred times. So I never actually mm -hmm. slept because I would have to, this compulsion, right? To check my alarm clock. So I was getting an hour, two hours of sleep a, a night max. 
and you know obsessing me and like well if my alarm clock doesn't go off i'm going to miss school and if i miss school uh, i'm going to fail and if i fail i'm going to end up homeless like like just uh, anxiety spirals that make no sense and so therapy was just a thing that i always knew to do um because like when you're 8 you, you don't even realize the stigma behind therapy uh, the same way you do now i knew it was kind of weird i spoke to my friends about it, like why do you need that are you messed up and i'm like i am messed up you know me like i need some fucking help here like this is not how a normal kid should be behave like i think we all agree that, with that so i was very lucky i i think it is slightly different for queer men. You know what I mean? As opposed to we obviously there's some elements of toxic masculinity that many queer men still have and internalized homophobia. But I feel like a lot more queer men tend to be in therapy and we know that we need it because we've experienced a level of persecution and trauma and whatever the fuck. So it's definitely more accepted. And, you know, we're seeing a shift now for straight men as well. Um it, it's slow. There's still, and there are a bunch of also, it's like culturally relevant as well. As well. There's certain cultures who are just like, oh, no, you shouldn't be doing this. You don't need to do this. You shouldn't be talking about your emotions. Um, but I do think we are seeing a larger and greater shift towards uh, therapy, which is great. You talk about communication as the primary, you know, your number one sex advice is communicate with your partner. Always. That's always what it is for everyone's sex. Yeah. For you, how do you communicate? with them about mental health and OCD, because that is a different conversation when it comes to people you're having sex with. Yeah. I mean, I'm very upfront about being, you know, a neurotic OCD anxious Jew and my energy is somewhat palpable. Uh, I've been working on this in therapy for God knows how long I'm on anxiety meds. I've gotten literally nerve blocks uh, to my fucking brain. Like I've, I've done crazy shit. You know what I mean? I'm really trying hard here. Um, but it's, it's a, like it, it doesn't usually manifest too much in my actual like the way I behave to my partner, you know what I mean, which I'm lucky for. It's like I always treat them with respect and love. It's just kind of other aspects of my life and that I might need a little bit more support from them in a way that they don't necessarily need. And I think it's explaining and really giving them the feedback as to like, hey, th this is what I need from you when I'm feeling a particularly anxious because sometimes they don't know. It can be really challenging to be like, okay, how do I support Zach? Does he want advice? Does he just want me to listen? Does he want me to hold him? And in the past, I'd see myself getting frustrated with partners when I'm like, oh my God, they didn't even say anything. And then sometimes I'll see them saying something. I'm like, God, I just want you to listen to me. And I'm like, okay, well, Zach, that's not fair. Like, like that is not fair. Like you need to fucking decide what it is that you need at this point. And you need to advocate for yourself and let your partner know. So that way, you're not passively aggressively being like, oh, well, you didn't support me. It's like, well, I, like tell people how to support you. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And if you don't know how people should support you, you need to work on that. You need to try different things with your partner. You need to say, I don't know what the best method for you to support me is in this situation. Let's start with this. I might not like it. Then let's try something else. But you, you your partner is not a mind reader. So you, you got, you got to put in the work there too. You're talking about communication. There's a lot of, self-help books out there it's like how the sexes should talk to each other right um and <laughs> you know back to i can remember being young and seeing you know men are from mars women are from venus like so as somebody who dates multiple genders and talks a lot about it, communication are there differences that we need to be aware of and how are those addressed uh it, it's such a na um, walking through a minefield a little bit with this question. And I think there are slight gender differences and it's not, I don't know if it's, it's biologically innate, but when you were born male or you were born field, you are socialized in a certain way. You are told to behave in a certain way. You are told to act very differently. We socialize men and women differently, and this can manifest differently in relationships. But it's also like, you know, I've dated non-binary or just very, just like femme gay boys and they identify as gay boys and it's like well i i feel like i'm dating a woman right now you know in the, in the same thing here so like it's not necessarily you know about your biological sex here and i i think i i don't usually like these conversations or like this talk about it because it really ends up reducing someone to like a trope or stereotype and like 
okay, potentially uh, cis women behave more in this way or expect this way, or this is the social norm. It's like, fine, but also figure out what your partner wants, figure out how they behave, figure out what they need. Don't go in with some preconceived notions of, oh, because she's a woman, she's going to behave like this. Like, don't do that. And instead, figure it out and work together and see what the specific needs and desires and whatever it is that your partner needs instead of just assuming because of their gender or sex. Yeah, it, it's amazing to me how much pop culture stuff still reduces it to what you were assigned at birth is how you're going to communicate. Yeah. Um, which can be frustrating. So since you write an advice column that's widely read for a huge number of people, when you're writing sex advice, because people are so individualized, how do you come down to this is what I want to put in the column rather than everyone just say, you still need to talk to your partner and it's individual because you could literally answer every sex question that way. Oh, I think it's quite boring. I mean, the, there are a lot of if it's a general question, I don't answer it. Uh, like the more specific your question is and the more like I want to have a con like conversation with my partner. This has been the issues that's happened. I can provide you a script. So I it's really comes down to choosing. I, I get a bunch of questions, right? So I get to pick which ones I do. So the ones that provide more information allow me to be like okay this might be what's going on and here's what i think you should say and i also try to do something about like you know like the mechanics of sex or opening up the relationship i try to do questions that aren't just communicate with your partner right because otherwise you fall into that trap yeah the more specific you can be the more specific i can be in my response uh which is helpful when you come to write and you've been writing about bisexuality and sexuality and gender for years where do you want to see the focus of your work go next? Oh, my God. I, it's, you know, I've been thinking about this because so I am 32. Mm -hmm. uh, I just came out with a memoir, which is uh, young for uh, someone. Obviously, I, I go to the old age home where my dad lives. I'm like, oh, my son came out with a memoir. And they look at me. He's like 90 year people are like this little fucking kid wrote a memoir. He's like 30. What the fuck? What does he know? Mm -hmm. um, so. Like, I'm not going to be writing a memoir every year. That's not how this works. And I kind of, I don't want to say said everything I wanted to say, but like, I really did get to paint a lot of the bisexual experience, polyamory, kink, how to navigate rejection, uh, queer culture, hookup apps. I really addressed a lot of it in this book. And right now, my focus is on getting as many people as possible to read it. So that way we have this conversation. More and more people are educated and more and more people are feeling capable of embracing their sexuality. But like, I've been working on this book for almost five years. I started writing the proposal almost five years ago. And then I had to get an agent then I had to tweak the proposal, sell the book, write the book, work on edits, then do all this stuff for press, and then do a book tour. And now for the first time in like five years, I'm like, Oh, shit, what, what do I do next? Like, what's what's next for me? And I actually think you know, continuing this message, but then also moving a little bit away from sharing my personal experience. I've shared about myself so much in so much detail, as you will read in this book, you're going to learn way too much about me more than you ever possibly wanted to know. And I think for my mental health, I need to move away from me being the product of my writing. And I'm actually excited to my next project. I'm not starting it yet. I need a, at least six months before I write another fucking book here. But um, is a novel, a novel, and it's going to be center around a male bisexual protagonist. It's going to be a fun rom-com. He falls in love with a man, a woman. He's torn between the gay and straight worlds. We haven't seen something like that yet. So it's a way for me to, you know, increase bisexual visibility and polyamory and bisexual audibility through my work in a way that's potentially just like less me sharing my story and me um, sharing other stories. So for you, how is it having that much personal information out there? Hard. It, yeah. It's hard. It, it's hard. I, I think some people, you have a parasocial relationship with me where they think they kind of know everything about me. They automatically think we're best friends and then they get upset if I don't respond to them or something like that. A lot of people want a lot of things for me in a way of not just like, you know, sex, advice to get drink, whatever it is. And me being after like learning how to set better boundaries, being like, hey, I, I really don't have the time. You seem very sweet. Hey, I don't want to hook up with you. Hey, this is actually not who I am. And you have a sense of who I am because you've been following me on Instagram, my book. But it is challenging. And obviously, you have that plus a lot of people critiquing who I am. 
You know, it's like that this book is just like I get I get nasty letters. I get really mean things said about me. I got hit pieces on me and it's just can feel like a lot. It can be very, very overwhelming. And again, this is what I talk about in therapy all the time, right? And working on this and letting other people have their beliefs of me and learning how to set personal boundaries and not feeling guilty because I can't give everyone what they want to give and me having to say no and me having to kind of drop some friends or people in my life just because they're not respecting these things. But it's it's been a challenge, something I'm working on and something I think it's like, you know, muscles that I need to flex. So I feel like in time, as I get used to this, this is all just new to me right now, right? Mm -hmm. This level of D-list celebrity, D-list author, D-list celebrity author, right? You know, like it's new to me. And I feel like with time, I'll, uh, I'll hopefully, you know, get better at this. So when you're putting all of this out there, it's not just you. There are other people who come up in the book. There are other events how did the folks who were closest to you respond to this much of you being out there it's oh, i thought you were gonna say how did they respond to them being out there no um, no no but to, to, like because they're, they're learning some of these people are learning stuff about you that they may not have known before you dropped the book right it, it, it's they, they know the work that i do you know what I mean? I think if this was coming out of the blue and I was an engineer who then wrote this book, they'd be like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? It, it would be very shocking. I kind of been talking about myself and my sexual endeavors and the kinks that I've had for a long period of time. So it is just an extension for these people, right? Um, It's not necessarily completely new, completely overwhelming. I've been writing, you know, slutty about my sex life for forever so reading about my sex life isn't like that scandalous or different it just but there are definitely some more vulnerable and different sides of me when i talk about certain breakups and my family and stuff like that that people might not know and that stuff is kind of again that's nothing like as i don't want to say shameful or embarrassing but it's just different elements of me that they're definitely learning about you also brought up you know your next goal is a, a novel on representation of bisexuality uh, lately, there's been a trend of we want to make a character interesting on TV, so we'll make them bisexual. So it, it, where it's, are you? It's it's pretty funny, and it's essentially just like when a season goes on for six seasons, it's like, well, she's yeah. out of all the men she could have possibly dated, and we can't bring in a new guy at this point because of the plot. So makes sense that she's fallen in love with your female. Like I, it's almost like I don't want to say lazy writing. Like it's not a like. Sometimes it is like if they're doing a valid actual story of bisexual visibility and something that actually happens, or is it just like, oh, this is kind of hot and scandalous and we ran out of romantic partners. And so let's just do that. I mean, I take the wins. Bisexual visibility is bisexual visibility, even if it's lazy writing and not the best. I, I But hopefully I'll be hoping to change that and actually kind of showing a real deep narrative uh, that hasn't been seen before and a real one that really shows the struggles that bi people face at the end it's it's a rom-com it's gonna have a positive ending uh, that's of course that's what it is i don't think it's a spoiler right now but like it really shows that you can live a incredible life as a bi person a very happy fulfilling life um it just might be a little bit challenging to get there when you were looking for representation and when you're excuse me uh when you were uh, you know looking for bi representation in the media where are you seeing things that you were drawn to? What bi representation have you liked so far? It shouldn't take me that long to answer that question. You know what I mean? Uh, I did. I did kind of like in my crazy ex girlfriend the bi representation a little bit. In that one that was cute and silly, and I kind of like the idea of showing that, like you know, anyone can be bi, and and I do like that. There was the show on Hulu called The Bisexual. I think it only had one season, which was a little bit of a shame. And I really did like that one as well. Um, I did like Red, White, and Royal Blue. I don't know if you read that book. And now I think it's an Amazon movie. Yeah, Amazon movie, not series. And I, I just, I like it when they say the word bisexual. Mm -hmm. I don't like it when they're like, oh, well, you know, I'm... I like everybody or but it's like, I need you to say the fucking word that that's actually really, really important that you say the word. And when you don't say the word, uh, that's how we become invisible. And that kind of goes back to bisexual audibility and and red, white and royal blue. He was like, oh, I'm bisexual. Spoiler. Sorry. But like uh, it's been out for forever. It's the bestseller here. But like um, 
So I, I think for me, the, the times that they really use it and say it and embrace it. Oh, also Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, if you've read that. Definitely worth reading. I think it's been on the New York Times bestseller list for like a couple of years now. It has not gone off the list. Um, so that's another one. So we're starting to see better fiction representations. We're starting to see some other nonfiction representations. There's Greedy uh, by Jen Winston, a great bisexual female book, which is really cool to read. I'm trying to think what else here that I've read recently that I've liked. Um, yeah, we're seeing more cool stuff in books, honestly. And obviously, I read a lot because that's <laughs> that's what I do. That's my job. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, it's a great transition. As as a writer, you got to read. Uh, so, what are you reading right now? Oh my god, I just read Open Throat, which was a, a such an interesting book about a uh, gay mountain lion who lives. Uh, underneath the Hollywood sign, he's kind of depicting people in LA, and it's it's like a novella. You could read it in uh, an afternoon. I read it in a couple hours, and that was just like a really interesting way. And in the way he kind of talks about queer identity and commenting on the people in LA through a mountain lion's lens, it was just something really interesting and different. I just read this book last week or, or earlier this week. I finished reading a book called Tweaker World, which was by Jason Yamas, and. That was wild. It's about how he became the largest meth dealer in San Francisco in the gay scene and like the meth and GBL scene and like his struggle with sobriety and kind of the internalized homophobia that leads us to doing drugs and only being able to be intimate when you um, are on drugs. So that uh, I just finished reading last week, which is good. I feel like oh, now that my book is done, like I can actually read books. I feel like there was like a six month period of me writing where it's like you write all day. And the last thing you want to do is like, oh, let me pick up another book after I've been writing all day. But now that I'm like writing significantly less, I'm like, oh, actually, I do love reading. Um, I also read uh, this a couple weeks ago, which was good. Uh, is it hot in here or am I suffering for all eternity for the sins I committed on Earth by Zach Zimmerman? Again, a book that you can read in the afternoon, really fun collection of essays about um, a lot of it's his relationship with his mom and coming out as gay. So that's kind of the books I've read in the last month or so. But I think a lot of what I'm reading right now is when my book came out, you're you're on a bunch of kind of like excited lists like, oh, best LGBT books or books we recommend or books we love with other authors that kind of came out in that month period. And there are a lot of books that came out in May and June during Pride. So I'm reading just a lot of LGBT books that uh, came out within a month or two period. And I'm like kind of then meeting with these guys. I end up with these like new author friends. It's kind of cool. It's like you're this class in a way that graduated together and you have this affiliation association. So I'm catching up on all the books I didn't get to read during Pride. That's awesome. So you're you've been out, you've been doing your book tour, you've been going around the country. What's the reception been? Oh my God. It's when I'm there, it is incredible. It is people sometimes people come up to me and they'll think I'm like fucking Beyonce. Like they're like shaking coming up to me. And I'm like, hey, how are you? Come here. I'm a goofball. Like you're fine. And I I, I get a message pretty much daily about how this book has changed their life. And mm-hmm. One thing that's that I mean, this is why I do this. I got so much hate and vitriol. There are people who hate the book. They hate my take. There are people, obviously, conservatives hate it. There are liberals who hate it. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, my like, so when I get these messages, oh my God, it makes me feel like, okay, I did this for the right reason. I am helping the community. When some people are like, you're hurting the community and what you said, I'm like, ah, did I actually? Not? Like, no, it helps me stay on the right course. It's very helpful. Um, one recently, and oh, oh, and one thing that's been interesting is that like it's not just one chapter that people resonate with. Like when people are telling me the favorite parts of the book, what resonated with them the most, what had the most impact, it, it, it's all different sections, which actually makes me feel good as a writer where it's like, oh, great. So like I did bring in this inclusive part here and this is resonating with people and it's not just one section, but it's the entire book. So that makes me feel just very kind of affirmed in the way that I wrote it. And a woman recently goes like, Zach, like your book has been more helpful to me than the last year of therapy in its entirety. And I responded, I'm like, you really need to get a better therapist. And she laughed. But like, um, so getting these messages, the feedback has been for the most part, great. Uh, And of course, there are always going to be haters and people who write in with very negative messages. But it seems like slowly but surely it's reaching its audience 
And that's really important too. It's reaching, you know, the bi people, poly people, queers, faggots, alternatives, kinksters. Like that's who this book is for. And it seems like it's finally getting into their hands, which is really good. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's one of the reasons that I wanted you on the show is because I do think so many of my listeners will resonate with this. Um, and and definitely it's it's well worth a read to anybody who's listening to the the interview. So we will have the the link to the book on the show notes, obviously. But if people want to find your work, if they want to follow you, if they want to listen to you, if they want to reach out, plug all your things. Sure. So uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Zachary Zane underscore. That's the best way to get in touch with me. My website is ZacharyZane.com. I also have a digital uh, zine on Substack called Boy Slut, which is either great branding or very confusing. But that is I publish nonfiction erotica from kinksters across the globe. Uh, Be warned, it is extremely raunchy. It is extremely graphic. It is not for the faint of heart. It is graphic, rough sexual depictions. If you are into that, highly recommend. That has been my passion project. That is just awesome. This this zine has like grown and I now have like over like 6000 subscribers, which is really cool. So definitely check that out. Uh, and of course, yeah, uh, buy bo- Boy Sluts. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon or just any local bookstore as well, anywhere books are sold. And yeah, thank you so much for having me on the show. This was a lot of fun and a really great conversation. Thank you. And thank you for being on. Before we end, I want to plug the Fun Factory stuff. Uh, because Oh, yeah. Um, yes. So on on my other site, listeners, loveletterstoaunicorn.com, I do sex toy reviews, the good, the bad, and all in between. And Zachary is working with one of my favorite producers, Fun Factory, and you have the Buy Amore. So you want to talk about the Buy Amore? Fun Factory has the Amore, which is a very popular dildo of theirs. And they want to do a collaborate, uh, do a collab with me. So we did the Boy Slut Buy Amore dildo, and it's in the bisexual flag colors. So it's like the pink, blue, and magenta. It is on the smaller side, which is so funny because I had a few like friends being like, Zach, like this is going to fall in my asshole. Like, you know, your readers are can take fucking fists. Why did you get the small one? I was like, so it is a little bit on the smaller side, but that makes it great for beginners. It makes it great for foreplay. It makes it great to warm things up. And then if you want to take a bigger dick or you want to take a bigger dildo, you're welcome to do that. But and it's, you know, harness compatible, uh, made from a silicone, all of that stuff. And it is. It is so cool to have this. It is. It, I mean, the toy itself is just great. And again, really great for beginners and something I just use to warm myself up with and just jack off with, too, when I'm like, yeah, especially if I don't want to like douche or like do something like that. And I can put yeah. something small in there. Anyway, I don't want to get too graphic here. It is so much fun. You can buy the book on. Yeah, you can buy the dildo. Sorry, on Fun Factory. And they actually have like a package deal. So you can buy the book and the dildo together something I highly recommend doing and also a really fucking great gift for any bisexual person in your life. And I totally second that. My review of it is fantastic. We'll have the links to all of that. Get the package, get the dildo, get the book. Enjoy them together. There are chapters that are appropriate to read with it in you. Oh, absolutely. And I I posted on Instagram. I was like, has anyone like jacked off while reading my book? And like, literally, I got to pull out of something where like 40% we're like, oh, yeah. I'm like, all right, you guys are just saying that. Like, what section did you jack off to? And then they're like, literally naming. I'm like, oh, OK, yeah, no, no, that was that was a sexier section. OK, no, you weren't. You were not lying here. No, I I take it. So you can also while learning to overcome sexual shame, you can also pleasure yourself. I feel like the two go hand in hand. Look, uh, readers, check out his books and then do, you know, you do all the things like subscribe, review the show. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was great. And now, a moment of gratitude. I love that question. Honestly, I'm really grateful for the support system I have. I'm very lucky that I have found this like beautiful, blossoming bisexual community. I'm part of this. I always call it like a my poly cult, for lack of better words. It's not that we really just are a close friend group, but we have a discard, a discord. We go to like group trips together. We hang out. We talk to each other every day. It's this group of forty people. It's this like close knit community. And it's called a home. And I uh, like literally thank them in, in the back of my book and the acknowledgments as well. But like, I feel like I have found my people. I have found the people in my life who love me and support me. And I, it's, you know, I struggled making friends when I got to New York and all this stuff. And now it's just like, oh, my God, I can't imagine leaving. I am so grateful for these people that I have in my life.
thank you for listening to this episode of Fat Chicks on Top. Please like, subscribe, and review our podcast on whatever platform you listen to it on. If we like your review, we may even read it online. This has been an Auntie Vice production. Producer and host, Rebecca Blanton. Audio production by Sharon Smith. Music by David Manga. And more music by Sharon Smith. For more information about Fat Chicks on Top, please visit our website for all things Fat Chicks at fatchicksontop.com.